I'm Diane Gayhart, and today I want to share one of my favorite relationship hacks. And um, you can use this with virtually any relationship you have with your partner, with your kids, at work. And it really helps you communicate better, understand, have more compassion and tolerance um, for other human beings. And I use the Myers-Briggs, which um, many of you may be familiar with. It's used often actually in um, business consulting and in psychology. As a, and it results in 16 different personality types. And I find the types far less useful um, than kind of looking at the eight different functions that is the foundation of the Myers-Briggs and using that to understand where people are coming from, how to communicate in a way that's gonna make sense to them. Because often you can find yourself communicating and if that person comes from the opposite function um, that you, is kind of your default setting, often there is just this barrier in communication that can be hard to get through. And then what happens is we tend to come up with negative uh, stereotypes of this person. You know, it's difficult, I can't communicate, you never understand me. And a lot of that can be resolved by um, understanding the different functions of the Myers-Briggs and then learning how that person processes information and then how you best you can reach this person. And especially with, with, um, with couples, I find that where they have their chronic conflict, there's often a difference just in how they process information. And so we can stop attacking each other, labeling each other, feeling hopeless, and hopefully come up with some creative ways uh, to better communicate, to have a tolerance, understanding, and even respect for um, the, uh, these differences. And so I use the Myers-Briggs in a very different way, not to label or categorize people, but to consider how another person might be processing information differently than we do, and then using that information to improve how we communicate. So. So let's start. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do in this video is kind of walk you through the eight basic types. And then in um, subsequent videos, I'll go into more specific detail about how to use them in various contexts, such as, you know, with your partner, with your kids, at work, teaching, even in writing, how you approach writing. Uh, the Myers-Briggs can be very useful because it, it looks at just how we process information and how we make decisions. So let's jump right into it. So there are eight different um, I call them functions. This theory is based on the work of Carl Jung, although it certainly um, was further developed by um, a mother-daughter team, Myers and Briggs, hence the name of the test. And um, the concept here is that there are eight different functions, and ideally, if we reach maturity and adulthood, we get good at all eight. It's not that one function is better than the other, and I often hear People talk about it like, oh, you know, I'm this type. I, I knew someone who had his type on his license plate. Like, this is the best way to be. And, and that's the total wrong approach. It's, it's that all of us need to get good at all eight functions and each, and there are different contexts where a particular function works better. So I think that's one of the most important concepts to get, especially when your partner is driving you crazy because they're coming at things from a different um, way of processing that um, the idea here is that there's no right or wrong, there's no better or worse, it's just different, and you need to get good at all of these to be a balanced human being and navigate life as smoothly as possible, and those people who come, who have their default settings different than yours, you have something to learn from them. So there are eight uh, different kind of functions, and we have a preference for four of these, and the other four we have to uh, focus and develop those skills to become a balanced, mature adult. So let's jump right into it. So the first one is, the first function is extroversion versus introversion. And we hear these terms a lot uh, in just everyday talk, and, and they're used very specifically here. And within the field of psychology and mental health, certainly there are different ways to measure and define extroversion and introversion. So let's just focus, get rid of the stereotypes you have in your head, both are good in this system, both are healthy. And, but the real difference here is where's your default um, attention go? So extroverts focus on the external world. So when, they, um, when they're thinking and when their brain is just going through the day, the default focus is on that external world. For introverts, 
their default focus is on the internal world of ideas. So for extroverts, um, one of the best ways to identify whether you're an extrovert, because it's not whether or not you're the life of the party, either one, an extrovert or introvert in this system, can be very social. They can be the life of the party. They can, um, you know, have lots of social relationships. The difference is for the um, extrovert in this system, that really fuels them. It brings them energy. Whereas the introvert, if they're the life of the party, extremely social, they still need to go back home and recharge and uh, their batteries in a more solitary or quiet activity. Um, so an extrovert can get more anxious alone. They have some struggle uh, sometimes being alone. So I think one of the best indicators um, as to whether or not you're an extrovert versus introvert is whether or not you talk to think. So extroverts talk to realize what they're thinking. And this can be very draining if your partner is an extreme extrovert and they are constantly needing to talk to someone to think through their ideas. The introverts, on the other hand, they need time to put their ideas together in that internal world, and then when they speak, they have very coherent, well-thought-out ideas. So, also when an extrovert's writing, for example, a paper or something, they write everything down, and at the end they realize, oh, yeah, that's my hypothesis, that's my main idea, and they have to go back, put it in, and then reorganize from there. Where an introvert, when they're um, writing or putting ideas together, they think it all through, they have that structure, that outline. Once they have that, then they can go through and put their ideas together. So in general, when introverts speak, it is more coherent, well thought out, where when extroverts talk, um, you're gonna see a lot more ellipses. And so, fair warning, I'm an extrovert. So if you wanna transcribe this, there's gonna be all these little ellipses because that's how I process. So that's extroversion versus introversion. And, um, and so that's the first function and the first set of differences. So the next one is sensing versus intuition. And so in the system, we use the letters for each of the eight types. And because introverts took the I, the, um, the introverts took the I, the uh, intuitives get the N where the sensing is an S. So it's S versus N here. And so this talks about how you take in information. So sensing types tend to take in information through the five senses. So sight, sound, smell, taste, feel. So they're, um, so when they, that's how their brains process information. So for example, they walk into a room, they're gonna notice the textures, the colors, the details of everything. And so sensing types are extremely good with details. They focus on details, they track details easily. Um, or in contrast, the intuitive types look at the patterns. They look at the, um, how, how things are organized. And so when they walk into the room, they're gonna notice how the different parts, what are the patterns that emerge, how close are things, how distance, what are the patterns there? So introverts look at these larger, broader patterns, sensing types focus on the details and the bits. So when learning something new, sensing types need, you know, all the steps lined up, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then they get the big picture. Where in contrast, the intuitive types they need to have the big picture framework laid out for them. And then they, only then can they track the details. So if you're talking to an intuitive type and you've not told them where we're going, what the point is, and you're giving them lots and lots of details, they often really can't track those details. And a sensing type thinks they're doing this beautiful job of laying it out step by step by step. And they're so perplexed and frustrated when the intuitive type gets totally lost in all of those details. So the intuitive types tend to be the ones who, you know, have trouble tracking details, tracking their keys. They need to keep to-do lists to keep themselves organized. More often the sensing types can do all of that without so much um, effort to track those details. So that's the sensing versus the intuitive. And the next is thinking versus feeling. And so we often have this distinction or we're pretty conscious of it in our uh, culture because it is the only one of the um, 
the different functions, these two are the ones that have a different uh, gender difference. And so 60 to 70% of men are thinkers and 60 to 70% of women are feelers. And so in this particular system, the thinking versus feeling distinction refers to when you're going to make a decision, what do you weigh more heavily? What's logical, what's fair, or what is compassionate, what is heartfelt and how the people in the situation are feeling. And so this is a classic point of tension in uh, lots of different types of relationships. So the thinkers are very focused on what's logical, what makes sense. Um, when they go to buy a car, they're going to research all the stats and statistics, the gas mileage, the repair costs, um, all of those sorts of things. And that's going to be weighted more heavily um, than <clears throat> other things such as how the car makes them feel and how other people are feeling about what people want in terms of a car if it's a family making the decision. Where on the other hand, the feeling type, when they go to make a decision, they are thinking about how it's going to affect not only their, their feelings, but everyone else. I think the easiest distinction here is feelers are not at peace um, unless everyone in the room is happy. And when there's tension, it's very hard on the feeling type to relax and be at peace. Where thinkers can have debates about ideas and concepts, and it doesn't, it doesn't weigh on them. It's not personal. And it, um, for them. And so this is a place where sometimes a thinker can want to debate some ideas, um, and especially in a close, intimate relationship. And their partner, if, they're, if the partner is opposite in a feeler, that can be much harder on the feeling type, on the feeling type partner. So it's an important uh, dynamic. Um, also in work context, you'll see similar dynamics played out. And it's important um, I mean, both functions are very, very important to make good decisions, to be taken into consideration how people feel about it, as well as to, you know, what is logical, what is just. Um, and so this is something where often in relationships, more often than not, the feeling part has to lead and, and be weighted more heavily. And in work context, more often than not, the uh, thinking has to lead. For example, I'm a professor. So if um, I were to, and I, and I manage faculty and staff, the students. So if I were to make my decisions at work based on what is logical, I mean, it would have, on the feel, using the feeling um, function of worrying about how everyone was feeling about the decisions and the rules and the policies and the program, basically the whiniest students and the whiniest faculty would, would win. And it would be a very unjust and unfair system because if you just come and complain to me, I'm going to give you, you know, I'm not going to make you follow the rules in the program. That would just create utter chaos. So in, in a lot of work functions that um, the, the thinking, the logical system has to, to win out basically. Whereas in relationships and families, worrying about how everyone's feeling is essential because you need to have emotional safety in family and close relationships, and that's paramount, and that always has to win out. And so looking at how to make that happen has, is very important to weight that side of the equation. And there's always a balance between uh, the thinking versus feeling, and in different contexts, different um, the thinking versus feeling needs to be weighted more heavily. There's not one single right way to do it all, unfortunately. Life's much more complex than that. And then finally, we have judging versus perceiving. And so this looks at when, how your decision-making process and, and how you approach decision-making. So judging types, they tend to like things organized, structured, um, and they also like to have decisions made. And so when a judging type goes to make a decision, they're going to try to, you know, gather the key information, and then they're going to try to make a decisive decision. Once it's made, they don't like it to be changed. Um, if they make an error in terms of decision-making, they tend to jump to conclusions too fast. They don't always take the time to gather enough information. But when they make a decision, they tend to stick with it. And their anxiety goes down once the decision is made. So that when this, you know, the, the process of trying to gather it all is kind of stressful, but once that decision is made, there's, ah, okay, it's good. So in contrast, the perceiving type, they love to gather um, information. They like to look at things from different perspectives. They like to consider all the different angles. They enjoy that exploration of possibilities, and that's very energizing 
for this perceiving type. And so when they go to make a decision, um, they usually research and considered it from lots of different perspectives. But when they go to make that decision, their anxiety often goes up because they're thinking of all the possibilities that, um, that are, they're not going to get with this one final decision. Because no matter what decision you make, there are certain uh, um, options that are just not going to be part of this. So when you make a decision to buy a car, there are certain options that you could have gotten in another, you know, a vehicle, but you made this decision, and so you got certain things and you lost others. So their anxiety tends to go up. They tend to be the ones who take forever to order at a restaurant um, because they're looking and thinking about all the different possibilities of things they could order. And often, no matter what they order, they're kind of like, ah, I wonder if it would have been better if. And so they tend to second guess themselves a lot. Um, and they also tend to go back and change their decisions. And so what happens often if they, for example, if you've got a, a couple and there's one's judging type, the other's perceiving, or this is at work even, you'll see the same dynamic happens. The, they can make a decision and the judging type is like, good, done, all done. With the perceiving type, they usually can't help themselves and they go and get more information or more information comes to them or they just think about it some more themselves and they wanna go back and renegotiate or make a different decision or change that decision in some way. And that's very natural to their processing. And where the judging type is like, whoa, 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 we agreed on something here, you're breaking the deal. And that's not how the perceiving type experiences it. It's like, well, I got this new information, so it changes my decision, you know? And so there can be a lot of conflict around the judging versus perceiving types um, when it comes to make decisions together because they approach that process so very differently. And so in general, the perceiving approach is good for bigger decisions like where to live and, you know, a job because they're going to look at things carefully from multiple different, different angles where the judging type is better when a decision needs to be made and um, often lower stakes decisions um, or just a decision needs to be made and stuck to. Perceiving types tend to be the problem sol sol solvers. So they're the ones who, when there's a problem in the system, they can look at it from multiple angles and you know uh, address the solution. Whereas the judging types, they tend to be the ones who set up a, a coherent system, um, and and so that people you know they set up the rules for the system, the policies, and so they're the ones who set up the system, and the perceiving types are the ones who fix fix things when that goes wrong. And so they really need each other um, to really function well together, um, but they can you know really annoy each other when decisions need to be made. So that's a quick introduction to um, the Myers-Briggs and how to use it as a relationship hack to bring it to how any struggles you're having, having in relationships or sometimes even with yourself and some of your own habits. And instead of um, vilifying the other person, learning how to communicate across these differences. And so um, in some of the uh, subsequent videos, you'll learn about how to use this with couples and parenting, as an instructor at work, working with coworkers to improve your relationships. But these are the basic principles. Hope you found it useful.